good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here in this lecture called Psychedelic Assisted Therapy. We're going to dig into the psychological aspects of this amazing topic. Thank you so much also to the European Institute of Consciousness Research for allowing this to happen and just sharing all this knowledge. So welcome and hope you enjoy. Well, my name is Marta Perez Carmona. Here you have uh, my email and our website in case you want to contact us and let's dig into it. Just a little background. Um, I'm, I'm Spanish. I was raised up in San Francisco, California, where, where I like to say that I got a little down loud of this topic in the 90s. I, I started uh, studying history of art, where I really like the symbolism, the mythology, but I, I ended up uh, being a psychologist. I have also have a master in um, expressive psychotherapy, psychoexpressive therapy, specialized in group, and in neuropsychology, which is what I do today. The first time that I got in contact with psychedelics was in Amsterdam, where I also used to study psychology uh, with Open Foundation. And it really got my attention how they could do this LSD research, research, for example, in universities. So the last five years I've been um, living and working in Costa Rica, where I got the chance and the privilege to work with various business and entities and groups, for example, with, um, with Thea Retreats, uh, with Missilia Magazine, or with tripseeders.org. At the moment, I am the director of INAWE, in O, which is the Spanish Observatory of Psychedelic Therapy, where we're going to we're trying to make this real in our country. So let's dig into it. Why psychedelics? Main interest for me in psychedelics is the cohabitation of mental health, spirituality, neuroscience, history and art, chaos, symbolism, consciousness, and specifically resilience. That is what I focus basically all my work. The moment that we are living right now regarding psychedelics um, has changed, has evolved. It was very prominent in the 70s, but in its stop for reasons that could be explained in another lecture. And since 2006, there, there is a new development. At the moment, we are living what is named uh, the third wave. So. Since 2020, for obvious reasons that we all know, the need for mental health became a priority for the population. This need for mental health increased the interest in what is mental health and how it can be treated. This interest and necessity gets you into new interventions. Happen to be that these new interventions also were already, were already explored in the 70s but we're stopped for political and probably economical reasons. So this, um, these new interventions, uh, also with all the development in neuroscience, for example, uh, reson magnetic resonance with seven Teslas that we didn't have before, right? Uh, promote a re-engaging re in psychedelic research. And with this re-engaging in psychedelic research, new questions arise. In mental health, the moment that we are living right now, it's a lack of integration between pharmacological interventions and psychological interventions. We can see it today, how it's very fast, the interventions that are promoting, for example, uh, public health, only have like 20 minutes for each patient. And, but there is also the, um, a lot of evidence regarding how multidisciplinary interventions, specifically in psychiatry and in mental health, are the, the most efficient one. For example, including the family or working with various professionals. Uh, in neuropsychology, you see this a lot. You have to work with the psychiatrists, the psychologists, the, like we all have to work together as a team. So right now, the moment that we are living is we are having a lack in 
new medication, specifically for mental health. In psychology, we can only uh, be working with SSRIs and benzodiazepines, for example. And all these medications are based in controlling or stabilizing symptoms, not curing. Um, there's also a chronic use that is being promoted that has obviously obvious side effects. And there is no medication for the fear of death. There's some very core, um, um, very core sensations that are not being treated and they're not being really included in health, right? There's also a passive and secondary a role of medication in therapy. At the moment, we are not working with the medication. We are working thanks to the medication, in spite of the medication, or during medication. But we are not working with medication. That is something that from psychedelic-assisted therapy, we do. So we have now, we know that these medicines in most countries are scheduled as type A, type, type 1 drug, are scheduled as type 1 drug. This means that they have no therapeutic use and are highly addictive, which we know based on the data that we have nowadays, the evidence, the scientific evidence that we have nowadays is not true. So we have these medicines with no therapeutic use according to legality. This medicine has, these medicines have a traditional use. They have an historic use in the West, for example, in the 70s. Some of them are created in a therapeutic context, for example, MDMA or LSD. And we know nowadays, thanks to all these scientific evidence, that of course we need more research, but the data is there, that do have therapeutic applications. So maybe it's time to reconsider this schedule one for these com components, components. So what we're facing also at the moment, it's a change in the paradigm of mental health. Right now, what has been also shown to be most efficient is the adaptation of the therapeutic model to the patient. We obviously need theoretical mode models, but every patient is different. Every case is different, and we need to take this in account when we approach as health providers, uh, our patients. So there's a tendency to consider multidisciplinary interventions as more effective, as I said, a revaluation of the legal status of some of substance with therapeutic potential. Potential, As we said, uh, it makes no sense that these uh, components are scheduled as type uh, one. And there's also the necessity to adapt to these new situations that are arising. For example, this increment in depression, in anxiety, in the suicidal, the suicidal rates, all these issues that are arising. No? What we are encouraging, it's an empowerment on the autopoietic process of the individual. Autopoietic is a word that comes from Umberto Maturana. Um, and it comes from biology, but it's basically the system, the cell, creates what they need. So this is the aim that we, we want to have in this new paradigm. We create what we need, and what we need is new interventions and new solutions and new approaches to this. So this is a, um, something that uh, Carl Jung said, when he has a psyche, he cannot be eliminated from it. So with psychedelics, we really see this. So all the trauma, all the difficulties that we've gone through, they do not get erased from our unconsciousness and even from our consciousness. It's still there. And with psychedelics, we have a very useful window to work with this. How do psychedelics work? In in a very like a reductionist way, it basically creates an awareness of the emotional processes from the memory. We will get into this later from neuroscience. 
It also modulates the identity or the ego through the default mode network. And it's very significant to the individual. At the end of the day, especially from psychotherapy, significance really moves the person from one place to the other, right? Let's see. So here's the question, what is psychedelic assistive therapy? There's a lot has been spoken about this, but let's see what it really is and how it works. So it's basically a therapeutic process powered by psychedelics. This is very important. This is a psychopharmacological intervention. So it's basically doing a psychotherapy process with the help of psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, or whatever psychedelic substance of the choice and the protocol that we've been using. It basically used these altered states of consciousness as a therapeutic tool. We use this to do therapy, basically. It's, it's a very interesting uh, therapeutic window for us. The choice of the psychedelic is adapted to the individual as well as the protocols, the timing that are gonna be used. So as we said before, this is the change of paradigm that psychedelic medicine brings to the table. Uh, it's not like a, a model where you try to fix, but a person where you see how you can adapt the model towards. And something very, very important, preparation and integration is as important as the psychedelic experience itself. We tend to think that, oh, because like I had this psychedelic experience, everything is gonna work out. But if you don't have a really good integration, that knowledge is just gonna be washed away. You're not gonna remember that. You're not gonna be able to put this in your day-to-day -day life. As we said, it's a psychopharmacological model. This means that it's psychotherapy assisted pharmacologically. So it's not you take a pill and then let's see what happens. That is the most imperant model that we have right now. It's you work with the substance. It's not, it's totally integrated, right? It's the therapy is the process, but the psychedelic is the catalyst. So you use this window that allows you to work with the substance as a, you know, it gives you more flexibility, gives you much more perspective, something that we really, really want in psychology. It is not centered on the substance, but in the invoking introspective states that this substance brings. So it's more about the subjective perspective rather than what the substance does. Although from a neuroscience perspective, we'll see later, and also new research that has been coming up, it's also very, very interesting. We also seek, seek to change the state of the individual, and the psychedelic, the psychedelic is always, always used in a therapeutic context. This is why it's not recreational, it's therapeutic, because we use it in this very specific developed context uh, where, we, where the, the psychedelic is just a tool. So what are the intersections between psychology and psychedelic assisted therapy? It's basically, what are the intersections and also what are the differences, right? Because they could be the same, but they're really not. Let's say that psychology is more like pure in the sense that it's on, only a psychological intervention, whereas psychedelic um, assisted therapy is a multi multidisciplinary model. You work with pharmacologists, you work with psychiatrists, psychologists, neuropsychologists in some cases. You work with uh, music therapists, for example, anesthesiologists, depending on the substance, right? There's a whole team involved. It's also designed to adapt towards the individual versus, versus sometimes psychology, you just, it's always adapted, but there's not that like, um, bigger sense that this is how it's done. Although it's always, always adapted. This is why psychology works, no? Because 
you go towards the life of the person. But it's basically psychedelic assisted therapy is designed to be adapted towards the individual. The therapeutic role is also very different. We can get into this later. But basically in psychology, you tend to have distance, although there's a lot of healing that and, and a lot of effi uh, efficacy um, from the therapy that comes from the um, psychological alliance or um, attachment, right, that, that forms. Um, but in, in psychedelic assisted therapy, the, the role of the therapist is very different. And it's very mutable between the sessions. It's not the same as, I mean, it's not the same the, the first preparation or the integration uh, in comparison to the actual psychedelic experience, right? It's also seen that it's good that the person, the client, the patient knows a little bit about yourself, not much, but the level of trust has to be higher. So the role changes. Also, the differences is the, the duration of the sessions, right? Psychology is normally um, one hour, 50 minutes, whereas these psychedelic sessions can be up to eight hours, for example, in the case of LSD. Also something, one another difference is the meta metaphysical content. With psychedelics, you're gonna have a lot of metaphysical context, a lot of spirituality that is gonna be emerging from the sessions. And this is something that, especially in cognitive conductual uh, psychotherapy, we don't see. So this is something that in psychedelic psychotherapy, we see a lot. And it's core to the therapy too. So there are therapeutic evidence in these disorders. The one that has the most evidence is depression. We have major depression, treatment resistant depression, also with PTSD, there's a lot of research, and also with addiction, specifically to tobacco, alcohol, opioids, but there's also with um, cocaine, there's some research with specific psychedelics, we'll get into this later, and with anxiety too. We have research with social anxiety, and this is linked to autism, there's also some research with autism, and there's a lot of research with end-of-life end anxiety. For example, in uh, cancer patients or patients that have had like a chronic diagnose. There's also some research in chronic pain, for example, fibromyalgia or inflammatory diseases. And there's also uh, some research on OCD uh, and eating disorders. OCD is a compulsive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. And as I say, autism, it's not that it cures it because it's not something to be cured, but it lowers um, the uh, social anxiety levels in some cases. It's very interesting, this field. So there is this theory that comes from Carhart Harris from Imperial College of London that is called the entropic brain. So all the... Going back to the other side, all of these um, diagnoses have something in common. That are what in inside analysis are called as neurosis, right? We have two spectrums of this. You have psychosis in one end of the spectrum that is linked to high levels of entropy, of chaos, of these organizations. And then you have in the other side of the spectrum, neurosis, that is characterized, as it says there, for being very rigid. So developing a behavior and compulsively doing it and doing it again, for example, addictions or OCD, eating disorders, uh, chronic pain, can, although it has like a very um, biological uh, perspective, there's also like the, the, the rumiations, there's also in depression, the rumiation anxiety, like thoughts that go and go and go and go again. So these disorders are also characterized by, as we said, rigid compulsive models of, of processing information, 
very little cognitive flexibility. This is a major point uh, that we will be exploring through this lecture. There's also feedback in its behavior. So there's something, some uh, positive reinforcement from this. Let's say the drug or um, lot, very wide topic, this one, no? But there's something that allows you to go into this behavior one, one and again and again. And very low entropy. Neurosis has very, very low entropy. This means that it's very rigid. It has a lot, a lot, a lot of a structure and very little chaos. From this theory, what basically brings to this neurosis-like um, diagnosis, if we want to use a psychoanalytical term to put this together, basically entropy is the capacity of, for adaptation, adaptation, flexibility. So you see here high entropy that will be characterized by psychosis, for example, and in the other side of the spectrum, you have low entropy, very rigid, right? And so what we are trying to find in, with these metabalances states that psychedelics bring, according to this theory of the entropic brain, very interesting if you wanna read about it, is the critical, critically proper moment, right? So as you see in the image, is this moment where you have enough flexibility, but you do not get lost in the chaos. So if this is like uh, in the spectrum, right? If you have this neurosis-like states, when you put in a psychedelic, it goes towards the high entropy. And then when you come back to your normal state, it allows you to be closer to this critically proper moment where you have enough flexibility to let go some behaviors, to adapt, and basically to be more efficient, right? As it says here, it's the optimal integration of information and an adequate fluidity of neuronal communication uh, from a neuro, neuroscience uh, perspective, and is sufficiently stable to maintain the integrity of information and to allow efficient neuronal communication, but also sufficiently flexible to adapt to change. This is what we want. We want structure, but we want flexibility. So with the psychedelic, we just press a button that goes through the high entropy, but then comes back. Uh, this information is highly important. Uh, whereas who, who is not, um, who would be a patient that which, whom we will be not be safe to take psychedelics? This will be people with high entropy. This means people with psychosis or tendency towards psychosis. Because they already have a high entropy, they don't need more entropy in their brain. Actually, what, what they need is more stretch, right? Going more towards the neurosis rather than to the psychosis. So I hope this is, um, with the pictures, you can understand a little bit. If not, you can write, uh, read The Entropic Brain from Carhart Harris. So what do all the protocols of psychedelic assisted therapy models have in common? Um, basically, they all, always, always have a pharmacological supervision. So we are not only uh, therapy psychologists working with the client or the patient. We always have pharmacological supervision in order to understand what if the dosage, the psychedelic, the, the protocol that we are introducing is safe, right? There's also super important, a previous screening. This means we'll get into this later, but this means that, as we said before, not all brains are for now, based on the information we have now and the research we have developed for now, not everybody is uh, safe to take psychedelics. So people with high entropy brains, it shouldn't be take them, taking them or it wouldn't be as safe as maybe further research uh, allows this view to expand, but for now we know this. So there's a screening um, for us to know if it's safe uh, for the person to take psychedelics. There's also a psychological preparation. This is 
super, super important. So it's not just you take the psychedelic and that's it. There's a psychological preparation. We'll get into this later as well. A set and setting is basic for everything. We've seen that set and setting that we will get into this later um, allows you to actually have a productive experience and basically puts the, the safety rocks for you to just walk around them. Also the accompaniment during the intake, this is also super, super important. And all the models have this. So the client or patient is not taking the psychedelics by themselves. They're doing it with a therapist, with a prepared person. We also always have integration. So after you come out from the psychedelic experience, you have a lot of work to do to put this, to like translate these things that you felt seen a lift into something that you can actually work with in your day-to-day -day life. And most models, and it's something that they should have, is a follow-up. So weeks, months after they have finished the process, it's good that you still get in touch with the person just to see that everything is okay, right? And also because integration might take more space than what we first thought it would take. Maybe we think it's three weeks, but sometimes integration takes years and it's good to have a follow-up. There's a lot of research on this too. So screening, as we said, not everybody is, for what we know today, is safe to be taking psychedelics. Some of the things that we see is history of psychotic disorders, uh, a family history, so a self history of psychotic disorders, but also a family history of psychotic disorders. This is, uh, a, it could be a predictor that it could like elicit a psychotic break. So we are not looking for this. We are looking for a hundred percent, well, not hundred because it's not always possible, but 99.9% .9 safety before taking it. Also, um, grave cardiovascular disorders as for example psilocybin and ketamine as we'll see later uh, make your heart bumped a lot so it's it's you have to take this in account also history of epilepsy or seizures also a uh, uh, grief grief that is not stabilized or um a ptsd right so ptsd that is not addressed or is not stabilized it wouldn't be a good idea to just jump into psychedelics first you got to stabilize the ptsd and the grief and then you might get into it because it could be a lot there's some research being done about this too so let's see also serious personality with disorders there's not enough research regarding this for example bipolar disorder of uh, a limit personality disorder, there's not enough research. We know that it's good for depression and depression is attached to most of these, is concomitant to most of these uh, diagnoses, but more research needs to be done for it to be totally safe. Also, you have to be very aware of the interaction between medication. And also it's not safe for obviously pregnancy and lactation, so there is not enough research being done on this. Um, if you have an unstable medical condition, it wouldn't be also safe. So when you want to access these uh, therapies, these psychedelic assisted therapies, they will make you a lot of questions regarding this. And if you have some of these criteria, it's very likely that they might not allow you to do it. Unless, as we said, every case is different. So every case is being seen as such. So, how do you create a design in psychedelic assisted therapy one of the most important aspects uh, in order for you to create the whole therapeutic design on that we are going to adapt to the person is the dosage so it's very different if you are doing macro dosing whereas if you are doing micro dosing super different for example macro dosing you're going to be doing like one between one and three intakes whereas microdosing you're going to be taking small doses regularly with different protocols right 
We also have mesodoxin, that is a medium uh, dose. This is also used, and you can combine it, right? You can combine first microdosing, then, then macro, then meso. You can create various uh, designs. Uh, there are some that are highly supported by scientific evidence, but as we said, we always adapt towards the client and the patient. The dosage also is being influenced by the psychedelic. For example, with ketamine, as we'll see later, you have a lot of intakes, right? Um, with LSD or MDMA, you only have a few. Also, the duration of the sessions. For example, DMT can be 20 minutes, whereas LSD can be eight hours. Number of intakes, as we said before, the psychedelic determines a lot of this. And then the integration. It's not the same ketamine integration than DMT integration because how the psychedelic works is highly different. The kind of information that is gonna be arising is highly different. However, this is adapted to the person, so it also depends on the person, as we said. So something that is crucial and center to psychedelic therapy. Well, this is a photo of uh, Costa Rica, of Manzanillo, where I used to live. So it's very interesting talking about the setting. The setting is a therapeutic environment. So where are you taking it? Is it in a hospital? Is it in a private clinic? Is it in nature, right? For example, we know that nature can be a, like a therapist itself, right? So it's very important to have a clean setting, safe, clean, and nutritious setting. And also we have the set. Set is the internal state of the person. This is why we have pre preparation, where we, we ask for consent, where, why we have um, sometimes a lot of uh, psychological interventions before. So how the person arrives to the sessions, we're talking about the psychedelic session, it's highly important. And it's the intersection between set and setting that gives a lot of the um, efficacy of the, of the intervention. So how is this uh, therapeutic, sorry, psychedelic assisted therapy process? First, we have the screening, evaluation and selection. Once we know if the person is suitable or not for the intervention, we do an interview. With the interview, we want to obtain information in order to do the therapeutic design and see what will be more fitted for the person, the diagnosis that they have, um, the intentions that they have, the, I don't know, the, the resources that we have, because it's also very important. Once we make the interview, we go towards the informed consent. Here we explore risks and benefits of the intervention so the person uh, knows what is going to happen, right? And makes an informed decision and give, gives informed consent about what is gonna happen. Here you explore, for example, am I allowed to touch you, for example, in the arm or in this part of the chest or in your head or in, in your knees? right? Or maybe they don't want the knees, but they want to hold your hand, right? This is very important because this is going to create a safe container for the person and also for responsibility matters. This is highly important. So once we have this, we start the psychotherapy. This, as we said, is adapted towards the person, so it can be between six and 12 sessions. It can even be less or it can even be more, but this is normally the amount that could be taking in place. Here we um, we first understand the life history of the person, and we create a report, as it's being called, uh, as it's called in psychotherapy. No, we create a therapeutic um, attachment. No, we set goals and intentions. We. Uh, we train the person in coping strategies that are gonna be super useful first for their own benefit, but also for the experience itself. For example, trusting, letting go, um, some 
safe uh, conditioning for they to use them to use in their experience, right? And we also uh, identify the significa significance, right? So what are the main themes that are going to arise in this person that we have in front row, right? right? After this, we have the preparation. This can be made with breath work. It can be made with microdosing, or it can be made with something else, for meditation, for example. But basically, we want to give a little taste of what will the experience be for the person so they arrive to the experience safely. Um, then we have the psychedelic session. Uh, this takes between four and eight hours. Uh, if it's DMT, 20 minutes, uh, or five male DMT is 20 minutes. Um, if it's ketamine, it will be 40 minutes, one hour. And after psychedelic session, we have the integration. This is the, the integration can be separate in post experience and also the follow up, right? After the experience, right after we have some little integration, but then we have integration one day after, three day after, five day after, five days after, right? And after this, when the, when the experience and the therapy has been integrated, it's important that we have a follow-up between six and 12 sessions. This can be even wider. And closure, it's important to have closure. In a very reductionist way of understanding, we have screening, preparation, psychedelic session, and then integration. Here we have, a, by the way, we have a picture of um, uh, some, some colleges from Barcelona who are doing an amazing job uh, with Cytosine and MDMA. So how is preparation? Preparation, as we said, you have the interview where you develop the therapeutic design. You have the informed consent where you explore risks and benefits. The therapeutic bond is being made through all this preparation where you have the report. The beginning of the psychotherapy where you explore all this, you also explore the copy, the, the copy mechanism that the person has and allows them to have um, new strategies to deal with this, and what are the resistances. And then in the preparation, you also have breath work and microdosing, as we explained before. So how is the psychedelic session? This is like the big incognita that everybody has. It can be personal or individual, or it can be made as a group. Here we have two pictures, for example. How will be an amazing group setting? I think this is in Costa Rica. And how will be an individual setting? As you see in the individual setting, there's uh, two therapies in the individual uh, session. Normally it's a male or a female, and, and the female. This is because there is gonna be some transference from the patient. This is a term from psychoanalytical models that basically you you still you put your models outside in the person that you have in front so maybe you have some conversations um regarding you, the attachment with your mom or with your dad right so it's important that you have these conversations with the therapist uh, some models say that it's not necessary that they are male and female right sometimes you don't have or sometimes you have queer people uh, it's also this is very important to take this in account. So you you want more fluidity in this sense. So this is a it, it can be very different to have, for example, a medical context or setting or a more like retreat setting. It's very different. However, it can be equally efficient if the preparation is there, if the person wants to be there, right? There's obviously a medical control. Uh, they might take your, or they should take your your vitals. Um, be there in case something strong happens, right? Or for example, there's a psychotic outbreak, which with a good screening shouldn't be happening, and with a big like a good um, setting and preparation shouldn't be happening. Actually, this is not what we're looking for. But you always have to be prepared, right? You always have to have a a con consistency, a con contention, sorry. 
So it will be a four to eight hours, but as we said, also 20 minutes with 5 mil DMT or DMT itself, 40 minutes with ketamine. And uh, the design of the space will also be according to the psychedelic itself. It's very important to have music in the psychedelic session. There's a lot of research being made with this. There's also um, some research made that basically says that music can be a psychedelic itself. So it's highly important to have music. Sometimes uh, the person is blindfolded so they can go deeper in their experience. Uh, but sometimes some therapists um, also provide some like a working, uh, like somatic therapy or like movement therapy within the session. This really varies, uh, depends on the person. Some people is more kinetic, some people is more visual. So we're going to adapt a little bit towards that. So how is, as we said before, how is this therap psychotherapeutic uh, accompaniment? So it's non-directive in the psychedelic session. It's non-directive as the person is the one that is giving the rhythm and the themes. However, and this is something that is uh, being discussed within this uh, psychedelic psychotherapy uh, realm, it's important to be a little direct. Not being direct as being a non-directed, unconditional, specifically, and compassionate approach, but sometimes you want to bring the person to the trauma so they can re-evaluate re it or reprocess it. Sometimes the, this can be seen as, for example, the person is just being focused for a long period of time, right? On the physical sensations, and we've seen that the, the psychotherapeutic use of that has been already extracted. And we want to get into, for example, the relationship with the dad, for example. So we do ask questions like, how would you feel, for example, if your dad was here? Or what would you say to your dad in this state? Or how will you feel your dad uh, will feel if you are happy? We just drop some questions, obviously highly adapted to what the person can take. So it's not too much, you know, very gently, but uh, trying to be a little like a surgeon, right? Like going to the problem itself and trying to like, this is maybe a perspective of mine, but trying to, destroy a little bit what they think it is for it, for what it really is allowed to enter in the situation. So it's non-directive, but there's a very compassionate and soft direction if the person needs it, because sometimes this is not needed at all. You just need like a little bit like to, to be a container, right? As we said, it's very, very unconditional. This is very important. Anything that happens, it's okay, and it's safe. That whatever happens is gonna be okay, and it's safe. You're always gonna be there, always as as a therapist in the psychedelic session, and also as a psychotherapist outside. You have this unconditional support for the person, so the person can graph you metaphorically and just go deep, and also a lot of compassion. This is very important because the psychedelic brings compassion. So if you bring that to the table, that is more easy to rise and for the person is more, it's it's easier for them to just like hold that, the compassion, if they, they're feeling it from, from you, right? There's also a limit interaction. So it's not like you're having a psycho psychotherapeutic intervention and you're speaking all the time and asking a lot of questions. That's not how it works. You're just there. And in case some tiny direction needs to be made, you're there to give it. But most of the interaction is just you being there, holding the hand of the person, reminding them that they're safe, uh, maybe dropping some words like let go or you're loved. Or, you know, it really depends on the situation. But there is a very limited interaction. It's more like a, just a presence more than an interaction. 
So it's important for the psychotherapist to have a, to register the sessions, for example, some words that the person said, obviously this with consent, as we said before, we ask for consent of what we're gonna do and what we're not gonna do, right? We inform the person and the person allows this to happen because if not, this will not be unconditional or compassionate and yeah. And we encourage, so sorry, we, we write down the words, some behaviors, right? Because um, it's many hours and there's a lot of emotions. So sometimes the memory of the therapist cannot be the best. So it's really useful to just write down the exact words. So we can use that for integration afterwards. This is very um, high level psychotherapeutic material. So it's important that we write this down. So we encourage the introspection, as we said, like we encourage to go deeper. We maybe if it's fitted for the situation and the person, we ask some questions to see if the person arrives to the, this like mental and emotional space. And uh, we use light physical contact, previously, previously agreed upon. So it's not like you are like, uh, you know, like grabbing the person or something like that, unless they ask you to do so and you have agreed before to do so, but you will never like force yourself bodily into the person. This is like a big no, right? And this even could be traumatizing if the person is not aware of this, this gonna, that, that this is gonna happen, right? So we just hold the hand, we maybe grab a little bit the arm, right? Like the head. If the person needs it, it can like maybe you can like, you know, like a baby. But the person has to give consent prior. Here we have like a uh, an image like different images of how the psychedelic sessions were in the 70s, for example. We have this woman. Um uh she's you see, it's very different. The setting is very, very different. They are even uh, doing, like, uh, for example, neuropsychological tasks. In that uh, historical moment, they weren't that focused on the therapy, although some, in some uh, research they were, but they were very interesting in what is this, how this works, right? So you have, for example, on the left side, you have a person doing like this, right? They're trying to understand like how is it working on your brain, or you have an interview with a woman who is sitting on a chair with will not be very uh, fitted for today's models, and she's as we will say tripping balls. She's like seeing the wall and being like, "Oh, the flowers! Oh my God, this is so uh, vivid!" Right? So there's a change on and an evolution how the psychedelic therapists, right, compared to, for example, these images. They're very different. So psychedelic sessions today, as we see, uh, they're very different. They have um, a lot of care in the setting. Uh, they can be even groupal as a group. They have music, smells, light. Everything is very uh, taken care of, very measured. Uh, so it will be very different. And we unless it's for like research, we don't use this as like to try to find information on how it works, unless it's for research, which, which then is pretty fun too. So integration. Integration is what happens after a psychedelic experience. Integration is non-directional. Uh, you can use uh, psychoexpressive tools and third generation therapies. We will explain this later. There's a consolidation of the experience. So basically here you are translating these amazing things you saw, you felt into something that makes sense and that you can you actually use in your day-to-day -day life. This can mean like not smoking anymore or having a better relationship with your partner or just making better like health decisions, for example, sport, a full, you know, like sleeping more, like healing something from your past, right? 
in the in, in integration you have a lot of, a lot of unconscious symbolic content so there's a lot of um um research around these two like don't take seriously what the for example what the ayahuasca told you like or the psilocybin told you like oh the psilocybin told me this and that okay translate this into something that makes sense like don't take it personally right don't take the message as it is try to translate it because this is symbolic con symbolic content sometimes the we've seen it right like um maybe the psilocybin tells you you were abused by your father but then you come back to your life and it's like this really didn't happen like i i weren't abused by my father however if you translate it maybe you weren't loved by your father and you felt that as an abuse right so it's very important to like water down and translate the symbolism and the concept from the session and integration uh, is very based on a transition towards healthier behaviors and we also have two kinds of integration the integration we have in the post intake of the psychedelic experience right and, and compound where it's basically it it basically goes towards just uh registration like trying to write how you felt what you saw maybe with uh, art therapy try to draw the symbolism and then more slowly and with more time you have the actual integration the consolidation so first the registration so you don't have to trust your memory too much uh, and the consolidation psychedelics used nowadays with therapeutic purposes that we know have scientific evidence first we have ketamine and esketamine psilocybin mdma lz ayahuasca dmt and ibogaine so first we have ketamine ketamine it's in most countries the only one that has illegal use in research public hospitals and private clinics this is why there's a lot of research being made with this and even though it might in my opinion right and some research there's some way more efficient and potent components because they are not legal in most countries uh ketamine is the one that is being used we know it's an anesthetic substance and you normally take it intravenously as you see in the in the picture uh, you need an anesthesiologist in the room and in the team and it has some very potent dissociative effects and some hallucinogenic potential. It's not always hallucinogenic, but for some people uh, it is. So this is why it's like put it, it's put under the umbrella of psychedelics. It's also, we sometimes say that this is like the Trojan horse for other psychedelics as it's the only one legal and it gives pretty good results for, um, as we see like major depressive disorder, and the treatment of resistant depression that are like very difficult to treat, disorders that are very difficult to treat, uh, chronic pain, there's also research, PTSD, addiction, eating disorders. So this is a um, pharmacological intervention that is legal. It's being used today in most of most countries and works with uh, diagnoses that are hard to treat. Here we have uh, this research. As you saw before, there's so many ways to do a protocol. So I'm gonna bring the first uh, research with a very, let's say weird protocol, but, or like break a little bit the models of what we think. So this is a prolonged ketamine infusion uh, model. It's basically, um, you give um, ketamine for 96 hours. I think this will be around four days. So you have the person um, having the intravenous um, ketamine fusion, infusion for 96 hours straight. And as you see in the, um, in the graphic, 
uh, the criteria for this was this is in a group of 21 persons with uh, treatment resistant depression and open trial with narrow imaging that we will get into later. As you see, uh, the the punctuation that they have on the MADRS that is a questionnaire for depression, but we know it works because the punctuation of the on the marts goes down as you see right after day five day five is when they stop taking the 96 hours uh ketamine infusion and what we can see with the neuroimaging that is this is super super interesting because it says in the title uh, modulates limbic connectivity and induces sustained remission in treatment resistant depression here you see the sustained remission in the graphic but let's get into the limbic connectivity. This is super interesting. So um, you can observe a decrease in the default mode network. We'll explain this a little bit later after the ketamine administration. So there's a normalization of the hyperconnectivity uh, of the default mode network. The default mode network, um, I don't think I have it in this presentation, but it's basically a network, a neural network that has some presence in the prefrontal cortex, um, around like in the parietal cortex and, and around here, no, in the lower level. Basically modulates metacognition, access to memories, and the modulation of all this. So interpretation of an external event uh, interpretation of your own identity. So we say that in this default mode network is the ego or the self sometimes, right? So we know that in depression and in anxiety and in other diagnoses, the default mode network has an hyperconnectivity and hyperactivation. So modulating and normalizing the activity of this uh, network is very useful because in depression you are thinking, for example, um of course this is gonna go wrong because i'm a mess everything goes wrong i don't deserve anything i don't deserve anything absolutely i don't deserve anything so you are having all these meta thoughts about yourself and this is uh like your default mode network is way too activated it's highly activated here you can see um in the neuroimaging, uh, let me explain a little bit. Um, there's a, like the default mode network, it's not as active, right? And there's a hyperconnectivity in the uh, cingulated cortex uh, and an hyperconnectivity in the limbic system, which are the same thing are connected. So basically, there's an increase in in the limbic in the limbic system with frontal areas that will implicit uh, more control over your emotions. Very simplified, okay. Um, and at the same time, there's a decrease of the default network. So basically, you are uh, digesting your emotions more, but without the ego. Very simplistic, but this is how it works. Also, why this very like weird dose of 96 hour ketamine, right? For this ketamine, this is to achieve a uh, determined uh, plasma concentration and block the NMDA receptors. We know that this produces antidepressant effects, and there are some um, pharmacological interventions that do this, but with this level, uh, we are like producing just biochemically uh, an antidepressant effect. So, why are the neurocognitive effects of ketamine and esketamine, as they're pretty similar, we'll explain this a little later, for treatment resistant major depressive disorder. So, ketamine and esketamine don't possess a significant negative effect in the brain functions. Um, maybe more research will need to be made, but Depression already has a pretty significant effect on neurocognitive. For example, um, your attention spam is shorter, your memory not, doesn't work, your executive functions, the way you plan and inhibit behaviors, 
is very like um, the tribe. So, well, the improvement uh, in processing speed, work memory, and cognitive flexibility after repeated ketamine infusion uh, increases. So there's an improvement in this, right? We talk about cognitive flexibility. Remember this word because it's highly important, this, this, this uh, theme. There's also a rapid normalization effect in brain areas that are key to the processing of emotional of emotions on reward. For example, in addiction, uh, the reward systems are highly activated, so there's a normalization, and this is pretty rapid. It happens like pretty fast. It happens like in hours after the treatment. The neuropsychological profiles can predict the antidepressant response to ketamine. So if you have a higher um, punctuation in the marts, for example, we know that you are going to have more impact, positive impact of the ketamine. And the findings back up a frame of neuroplasticity for depression and the potential of ketamine in treatment. Well, then we have esketamine. Esketamine, I, um, I'm working uh, weekly with esketamine in a public hospital. Uh, here in Spain, we use Esperabato from Janssen. Yes, you can see here the, the little thing. It's a nasal spray of 28 milligrams. Uh, we use it in public hospital. Uh, we use it for the treatment of major depression and treatment-resistant depression specifically. Um, and Janssen, uh, Janssen and Janssen, the pharmaceutical, proposed it as only a pharmacological intervention. So according to the use of Esperabato, there shouldn't be uh, integration preparation or even like being with the patient in their experience, psychedelic experience. However, there's been some change made and I have a very positive experience and we are publishing some things regarding this as how uh, we can use uh, the dissociation and the hallucinations that Janssen promotes as side effects. You can see it in the paper, just this is side effects. You might get nauseous and have a dissociation and have some hallucinations. For us, for psychedelic therapists, this is a major therapeutical opportunity and we use it and we have really good results. However, Janssen doesn't promote this use for various reasons. So, for example, economical, and also it's, it's a psychopharmacological intervention. So they are pharmaceutical, so they don't really want the, to pay a therapist to be there for X amount of hours, right? Going back to the topic. How are the protocols for Spravato? Uh, they are very similar. You obviously adapt, but they are like, First, you take it twice per week in the induction phase. Then you, to you take it once a week. For example, twice a week, uh, Tuesday and Thursdays. Once a week, only Tuesdays. And then after that, it could be like these barriers uh, because, because some patients need to be in the maintaining um, phase longer than others. This is what the clinical use uh, sees, but the pharmaceutical doesn't bring because it's like a model that fits everybody. But then in the clinical uh, settings, you see that you gotta adapt to every person, right? And after that, you do it every 15 days. This will have a variation of six months. Uh, and you will increase those. First, you take 28 milligrams, then you take uh, 56, I think it is 52. Uh, so it will be two two little things on this, and then you will take three. And normally you stay on the three doses for the maintaining phase and the end of the induction phase. So here you have, for example, um, a research regarding uh, esketamine for suicidal thoughts ideation in uh, depressed major depressed disorder. Um, this clinical trial has 68 uh, patients in it. It is placebo control, and you have the administration of esketamine plus the regular antidepressant medication. This is also very important 
normally skin is street and in public hospital as an antidepressant so maybe you can have another ssri because these patients are really um hard to treat so normally you have to two antidepressants being one is getting me. As results, we see a significant reduction of depressing and suicidal symptoms in this ketamine group in comparison to the placebo. Improvements in the first week of treatment held up to four weeks after a study. You can see here, for example, in the, um, you can see that there is some significance. This will be like zero significance, and you can see that there's some significance in uh, various tests, right? In suicidal thoughts, and so on, compared to the placebo. Here we have the next substance, MDMA. It has a legal use in clinical trials and is being approved lately in the last week, for example, in Australia, where psychiatrists can have MDMA therapies with their, with their patients. MDMA is basically an empathogen, an amphetamine empathogen, uh, we know, for example, regarding the clinical trials of MAPS, that there's a 63 remission on severe PTSD symptoms. So this is very important because uh, PTSD is not easy to treat. So 63 remission, it's very high rate, no? Right now it's being used in specifically PTSD. Uh, in PTSD, you have uh, veterans and war victims, and you also have sexual abuse. That are two themes that are being explored. And it's also used for social anxiety. As an empathogen, it makes you feel more connected. It puts you in a better like uh, mental and emotional state for you to create an attachment towards the person. Here you have an example of uh, the PTA, oh, sorry, the, here you have an example of the MDMA uh, therapy. Also two therapies. Here's important, uh, I, I feel like more than in psilocybin, in, with this pathogen, it's very important that you have um, different roles. In my opinion, it doesn't really need to be male or female because as we said, um, if we take into account queerness, uh, this is like a very like a fluid uh, topic, but it's important that you have roles for you to project. So maybe if you have, for example, in sexual abuse, you have, um, uh, you get triggered by the presence of men, this can be a very useful moment to explore the presence of men, right? Obviously, with consensual agreements uh, beforehand and with a female presence that makes you feel like any that nothing is going to happen, right? Because in your trauma um, and your triggers, you're going to feel things that maybe are not there, but you're going to uh, transfer this. So we have here an example of a session, right? And um, a, a research, a clinical trial with 30 people uh with a diagnosis of ptsd and they they received me a day and they received mdma with a psychological therapy as we saw before ketamine and esketamine are not really um using the assisted therapy models they are more like a pure pharmacological intervention however in mdma psychological intervention, psycho, psychotherapy, it's very, very uh, present. So um, we see in the neuro image, in the functional magnetic resonance, it's an increased activation in areas involved with self-referential processing and autobiographical memory when dealing with, the, with narrations of the traumatic memory. So basically, when you are talking about your trauma, about the experience you had, uh, these areas are being highly activated. However, in the past treatment, so after you go through the whole process of uh, psychedelic assisted therapy, 
there's no significant difference between traumatic and neutral narration, narrations. So basically, even if you're talking about your own trauma, your brain, these areas of your brain, do not get uh, highly activated. So they will have a normal activation that you could have just narrating that you drink coffee in the morning and you had a toast for breakfast. And you can have the same, like, uh, your brain activation will be the same talking about your breakfast and about your traumatic memory. So this is very important because in PTSD, you don't have this. So there's basically a decrease in the cuneus that you see in the uh, uh, functional magnetic resonance between pre and post. The results, as we say, there's an increase in the resting state functional connectivity with the hippocampus that in a very that in a very reductionist way will mean memory and learning with the amygdala that also in a very reductionistic way will be emotional processing so basically uh, there's more connectivity between memory and learning and emotional processing so you translate this you can uh digest better your memories and learn from that there's also a significant contrast with the cuneus when comparing previous uh, trauma to ne neutral reaction so basically seems to have positive effects on brain activity related to emotional and autobiographical processing basically your amygdala is not reacting and there's more uh, control in the situation. Um, and there's also more digestion of this fear, right? So these digestions uh, on a very like a neuroscientist level plus the digestion on the psychological level allows you to like have a 63% remission, for example, that it said in the, in the MAPS trial. This is another example of um, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and how it will happen. Uh, you can see CAPS is a questionnaire for, for PTSD. You can see uh, the punctuation here is 90 and how it decreases after every intake, right? So you go from 90 to 61. So just in the preparation, you have, uh, of course, here because they are like, you're being, you're gonna be treated, you're in a safe space, like all this also decreases the punctuation. So placebo effect plus psychological intervention, super necessary. Here you have a total of 40 to 48 hours of the total process. You have first preparation, second preparation, third preparation. Then you have the first MDMA therapy. Uh, session that looks like this. She has her music, her she's blindfolded with the two therapists. Uh, then you have the first integration, second, third integration, the second intake of MDMA. Normally you go a little bit higher. Then you have more integrations, the third MDMA. You also go a little bit higher and then you keep with the integration. And after all this process, you see that the punctuation is significantly lower. So this is also very used in couples therapy. Why is this? Basically because it's an empathogen. Most issues uh, that you see raised that, uh, that emerge in couples therapy are communication and not being able to have empathy with the other because you're trying to communicate and you're in a like active state uh, like reactive state, so you are not really understanding where the person is coming from. So, very useful for uh, couples to meet. Um, also, infidelity for some models uh, is considered uh, that could 
be some sort of uh, PTSD as you get these triggers, uh, you get this fear, you get this like lack of trust, right? So if we consider infidelity as a PTSD, this could totally fit into a model of PTSD treatment. It helps with empathy and tolerance, emotional openness, improves communication, decreases anxiety and fear, uh, there's more emotional connection and processing, we process blockages and traumas. So this is why it's so good for couple therapy. Okay, now we enter into one of my favorite systems, psilocybin. Um, with by reading there, sorry for the translation. Uh, this is a classic psychedelic, um, and it has a ceremonial traditional use. We can see this, for example, in Mesoamerica, um, uh, Mexican cultures. Uh, you can see it in history of art. There's a lot of this. There's also a lot of variety, varieties of um, fungi. So we even have like a specific um, mushroom in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain, where, where I'm from. Um, this is the substance that has been more studied since 2006. 2006 is when after the prohibition, uh, researchers started reconnecting with psychedelics. So since that uh, second wave, we are now in the third wave, that is 2020, Psilocybin has been one of the most um, studied um, compounds. We know it to be uh, efficient and have some uh, research support in depression, uh, treatment resistant depression and major depression, anxiety, end of life anxiety specifically, addictions. We know it works with tobacco, alcohol, and opioids obsessive compulsive disorder and chronic pain. Here we have um, a research on how there's um, increased amygdala response to emotional phases after psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. In depression, there is this thing where you basically only process or you have a tendency to process um, uh, negative emotions and you have very little reaction towards positive emotions, right? So this is what they're trying to study here. This is an open trial, so it's not compared to placebo, of 20 people uh, with uh, depression. It can be moderate or severe depression and treatment resistant depression. And they are they are tried, um, they are treated with psilocybin. Sorry again, it will be it's bad written, but psilocybina in Spanish, psilocybin treatment and exploration with uh, functional magnetic resonance before and after psilocybin, right? You can see here uh, very briefly the reaction. So um, before the treatment, the, the reaction was like this, and after the treatment, the emotional reaction was like this. So. How this was uh, conducted, there were two oral intakes of psilocybin sessions, uh, one for preparation with a medium dose, we'll say like a meso dose, and then a big macro dose of 25 milligrams after a week of the first one. Um, this 25 milligrams is what is called, what is uh, known as an effective, effective clinical macro dose using other studies, for example, with Griffiths, Ross, et, et al. Um, there's also a psychotherapeutic accompaniment, as well as some DMA. So semen always, always should have this accompaniment. Ketamine also, but mm, as we said before, because of pharmaceutical issues, we don't have this um, model so developed. So we see that there are uh, change, changes in the uh, area of emotional processing which implies a significant clinical improvement in the reductions of symptoms of depression and anxiety. So there's a 79% improvement on the quids and a 42.1 improvement in this, in this study. Uh, this is basically like an anxiety, uh, uh, questionnaire. 
this is basically an anxiety questionnaire, like how much anxiety you have, basically. Yeah, I'm very, very reductionist here. Uh, what we saw in the neuroimaging, we, neuroimaging with uh, functional magnetic resonance is a decrease in the activity of the amygdala. So amygdala, as we said, fear is not as reactive. We are not feeling as much fear as before. Highly important. In depression, we feel a lot of fear. And this is something that uh, just translates into most of our behaviors, right? Like, I'm not going to meet my friend because I have the fear of, reje of rejectment. So I'm not going to go outside and face a social activity, right? We also have an increase in functional, functional connectivity between the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the uh, medial prefrontal cortex, that it will be this area, right? So basically, as happened with ketamine, we have a decrease on the activity of the amygdala, but at the same time, it's being connected to the hippocampus. We said that the, we could like interpret this as memory and prefrontal cortex, that it will be um, behavior, and planification, more digestion, let's say, right? So there's a better digestion and assimilation of this fear regarding your memories. This, as I said, again, very reductionist view, but because it is way more complex than this, but basically the what it makes you feel is this, like I was able to digest my fear and I'm more in control of my emotions, translating, translating this neuroimaging into a neuropsychological, psychological uh, codes. There's also change in the neural networks involved in emotional processes correlate, that correlate with significant improvements in symptoms of depression and anxiety. So we know that this kind of connectivity and this kind of decreased activity of the amygdala is related to you not um, showing the symptoms of anxiety and of depression. That is what we were trying to measure here. There's also a correlation between increased, acti increased activation of the amygdala during emotional processing and reduction. Sorry, this will be decreased. So the decrease of the amygdala during emotional processing and reduction of the present symptoms after cytosine treatment. So if you react with less fear, very likely that you develop more trust, psycho psychologically speaking. This helps you not have as many symptoms. If you trust more your friend or the environment, you're gonna be exposing yourself in the, right, in depression, it's most likely that you're gonna take the chance to go outside. Uh, here we have another study. Um, yeah, this is another study of how there's a sustained symptom reduction following uh, the cytosine treatment for anxiety and depression in patients with life-threatening cancer. This is a beautiful research. Basically, it's people that had a, a, a diagnosis of cancer and it was a life, like life-threatening cancer. And they were given cytosine. So it's a crossover study, double blind with control placebo. The placebo was niacin. And the treatment is one dosage of cytosine plus psychotherapy. Very important, one dosage. You don't have to be taking SSRIs every day, just one dosage. There were 29 people involved in this clinical trial and they were measuring the person anxiety due to the cancer diagnosis. They're not obviously not trying to get involved in the cure of the cancer itself, but the emotional distress, the existential distress that is being called here, that arises when you know you're gonna die, right? So fear of death. So what we know, we see here, you can see, um, this is the placebo and this is the psilocybin. The decrease in so many like different uh, questionnaires, for example, the, the anxiety tra traits, um, 
less anxiety, less depression, better depression. So basically you see like there's a, a difference between not taking it and taking it, right? The psilocybin. So psilocybin generated significant improvements in anxiety and depression symptoms along with a reduction in the demoralization and hopelessness related to cancer. An improvement in the spiritual well-being and increase in the quality of life. Normally with this kind of um, diagnosis, what we really want to impact towards is the quality of life. You know, maybe you cannot like uh, get rid of the cancer, but let's have the best life you're able to have in this time. There was, because this is a beautiful research, there was a long-term follow-up from this 20, 29, right? 29 patients. Um, obviously there were some people that uh, died along the way because it was like a four year long term, as you see here. So when you see 68 to 80, it's because probably some, some of them left. So it's conducted uh, with the previous study and there was a follow up only with one intake, remember. Uh, seven weeks after, so there was improvement in psychiatry and existential anguish, quality of life and spiritual well-being. 6.5 months after, 60-80% uh, of par participants continued to meet significant anxiolytic and antidepressive clinical criteria. So this means they didn't show symptoms of depression. And 4.5 years after, 60-80% of participants met a significant criteria of clinical response of anxiolytic antidepressants. So basically, almost five years after, they took this one dose of beautiful psilocybin, you see it here, um, they didn't show symptoms of depression. Maybe some got cured, maybe some didn't, right? Because cancer is something else, but in a quality of life perspective, these people had a better life. And this is so important. So in a subjective, more qualitative data, participants attribute between 71 to 100% of their positive changes to the salicylic assisted psychotherapy. Diminuting it one of the most significant personal and spiritual experience of their life. Just one little mushroom intake with a lot of psychological preparation in a very uh, controlled setting, right? We have here some interactions of psilocybin, benzodiazepines, and psychotic, especially uh, selective SSRIs and so. Let's not get into this too much. I'm getting to LSD. Uh, LSD is a classical psychedelic. It was historically the most studied between the 40s and the 60s, uh, the 70s, sorry, 1940 and 1970. Um, it's artificially synthesized, but it comes from uh, fungi from wheat. And it's been used for depression a treatment resistant and major depression, anxiety, also end of life anxiety, addiction, PTSD, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, migraines, there's some research, and autism. Here you can see how it was used as daily seed in uh, the 40s, 70s. Well, we go to historic ways of historical ways that in the Western we've been using um, psychedelics in therapy. We have the psycholytic therapy. Psycho psycholysis, psycholysis, what means is liberation of the mind. It was very popular in the 50s and 60s in Europe. It's one of the most popular movements. And it was created by the English uh, psychiatrist Ronald Samison. This is basically, because it comes from psychodynamic psychotherapy, this is basically a typical uh, psychoanalytical intervention by using a mesodosis, so it's medium doses of LSD. Between, you see, 25 and 100 milligrams, micrograms. 
Um, so basically, you have six to eight psychedelic intakes in the process of 15 to 100 psychotherapeutical intervention, psychoanalytical interventions. What this seeks is to accelerate and facilitate the psychotherapeutic process. So bring down the ego defenses, defensive structures, and boosting the analytical analysis material. So this was very used. Right now it's uh, used that much. Um, but you see here the traditional LSD, and it will be like a typical setting of uh, psychoanalysis, Freudian, like Lacanian, you name it. So now we have DMT. That is also named the God molecule, as a lot of uh, most um, living creatures have this. No, it is said that it's synthesized by the body. However, more research needs to be done in this topic, as they haven't really found it. It's more like hypothetical. This is uh, different, for, some, for example, LSD or psilocybin, because it's, it has a shorter length and it's highly psychedelic. This is, I will say, the most psychedelic, psychedelic of all. You also have DMT and 5-meo DMT, that is what is found in Buffo Alvarius, the toad. Um, normally, it lasts between like, between like 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, but it feels like it's a uh, eternity. You can see here some examples of what could be going on. Um, and there is some uh, scientific evidence that it aids with uh, depression, major depression, treatment of system depression, anxiety, addiction, and PTSD. For example, right now, uh, the, there, it's possible that there might be a a clinical trial in Madrid, in Spain, for those interests, regarding 5 meo DMT and treatment resistant depression. It will be the first uh, clinical trial with psychedelics in, in Madrid. Not in Spain, but in Madrid. And obviously the integration is much more complex uh, because the kind of like uh, symbolic meanings that you're gonna meet in this space are are very uh, complex, let's put it that way. You see here oranges, because for example, oranges are uh, where the, you might extract DMT, for example. We also have ayahuasca. So ayahuasca is a mix between a DMT and an animal. Ayahuasca will say it's different to the other uh, psychedelics because it has a very wide and actual traditional ritualistic indigenous use. For example, in Latin America, it's used in shamanic context. So here you wouldn't apply the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, like the protocols, the screening and all this, no? Because here they have their own protocols their own shamanic context. You have diets that you do before. You have the use of other plants, for example, tobacco. The tobacco, you use that uh, a lot in mix with ayahuasca. And you also have chants that happen and the shaman or the taita, for example, no, uh, sings during the intake of the ayahuasca. It will be similar if you want to compare it to the Western approach of using music. So music is very important. Uh, in the Western world, we have what is called farmahuasca, that is a synthetic ayahuasca. And uh, there's some notion that there is therapeutic use in depression, major depression, treatment resistant depression, addictions, anxiety, and PTSD. However, uh, ayahuasca is not as easy to study because of this like cultural context where ayahuasca is met, right? Here you have an example of a research um, where it basically says that it has the potential use. It doesn't say it has, but it has the potential, right? In addiction, uh, cocaine, alcohol, opioids, 
and anxiety, and obviously for depression. But obviously more research has to be made in ayahuasca, but we also face the uh, cultural significance of ayahuasca, right? Here you get the, the question, culture or an therapy? And also everything in between, right? For example, you have the, the Shipibo tribe that uses ayahuasca in the rituals and how there's been a lot of um, uh, tourism, right? Regarding like psychedelic tourism. Here you have, for example, um, all this, an image of Ritmia, that is a space uh, retreat in Costa Rica that has a lot of name. Um, however, there's some like um, bad praxis going on. So you see there's so many um, ways of doing this and how culture and therapy and also economical matters meet and, you know, it's very difficult sometimes to see the line, right? Because we are adapting adapting um, a medicine embedded in a culture to non-traditional settings, trying to use their tradition. So there's, um, I mean, this is a whole topic of research and it's also important to give space to these kind of voices and to give space to these traditions and allow them to, to express their truth and not uh, take the truth from them. It's my opinion. And as I said, right, you have uh, in ayahuasca, you have the figure of the shaman. Sometimes the shaman takes the ayahuasca themselves in some traditions. You are not the one that takes it. It's sometimes, um, you know, it's very cultural, very embedded. Uh, so it's very difficult to study from a Western clinical, therapeutical uh, perspective. And I think there's a lot of to learn and a lot to respect and allow space for this to be protected too. Uh, we also have Ibogaine. Ibogaine, uh, it's traditionally used in Africa. As you see, there is like a, a root and a, and a fruit. And it's an opioid antagonist. So it's very, very used for treating substance abuse and addictions. There's some research regarding heroin, opioids, cocaine, and alcohol. So, for example, heroin, opioids, and cocaine, and even alcohol, they're pretty difficult to treat with only psychology, right? But with ibogaine and a very good integration and protocol, um, and because they're an opioid antagonist, specifically with opioids, uh, they can be very useful for these treatments. There's actually a research in Barcelona uh, conducted uh, for a opioid addiction with ibogaine. So let's see how the results go. So now we are gonna explore the therapy in the psychedelic assisted therapy, right? The, all the psychotherapy that goes beside that psychedelic intervention, right? What kinds of therapy, of psychotherapy are being like used? What are more efficient, what are less? So we know that there's some scientific evidence for this part over here. And that in practice, there's a lot of use of these ones. Um, so you have cognitive behavioral therapy, very used through the motivational interview, for example, with addictions, especially, and rational emotive behavior therapy. So just variations of the cognitive behavior therapy or pure cognitive behavior therapy. It's what is normally used in clinical trials. And so therefore there's more evidence, scientific evidence that this works. But there's also a sub-product of the cognitive behavioral therapy. We'll get in deeper into this later. That is called the third generation therapies. For example, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, mindfulness, that probably a lot of people know about this. 
we will explain this later. And the ones that are used in the practice, in the actual practice of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is logotherapy, psychoexpressive therapy, you can include somatic therapy, and gestalt therapy, transpersonal therapy, right? But because they're humanistic therapy, just as a base, uh, they are not as explored uh, from a scientific perspective because they are more subjective, uh, they are more adapted, so it's difficult to measure, right? So we have cognitive behavioral therapy. It's evidence-backed therapy, evidence-based. It works with thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Um, we use, as I said before, the motion, motivational interview for addictions. We use it normally, like outside of psychedelics for addictions, but it also has effectiveness in psychedelic-assisted therapy. We also have here the tercera generación de terapias, so third generation therapies uh, that come from the CBT. These third generation therapies are derived, as I said before, from the cognitive behavioral therapies and are focused on the capacity, in the individual capacity of adaptation and cultivation of acceptance and cognitive flexibility and resilience. As I said before, and we'll explain later, cognitive flexibility is one of the major aspects because you cannot have a different behavior if you are not flexible. And as we said before at the beginning of the lecture, we are trying to bring entropy, chaos into this, right? We're trying to create flexibility, create adaptation, create different ways of working with oneself, and therefore resilience. There is no resilience without acceptance and adaptation. The most popular therapies here are ACT and mindfulness. Some examples of third generation therapies are dialectical behavior therapy, compassion focus therapy, values based resilience therapy. As I said, resilience is a major aspect in this. For example, this one helps identify an individual's value and to maintain a commitment with themselves along with stress management techniques. Mindfulness. So I would say that all the, um, all the protocols have a little bit of mindfulness just because it helps you to be present in the experience and also helps you to digest the experience. Not all of them, but it's interesting that they do. There are meditation techniques that help cultivate a full and compassionate presence without making value judgments. So no judgments and total compassion are keys for mindfulness. And then we have ACT therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. I would say that this is one of the most used, especially with psilocybin. For example, in Imperial College, uh, we have Rosalind Watts, that for me, she's one of really prominent, she's a really prominent figure, but she, for me, she's one of the best therapists, psychotherapists that are working with psilocybin. And she always works with ACT or variations of ACT. With this therapy, we look to accept an unpleasant experience, something that is very useful for a psychedelic experience, as it's very likely that you're going to have like transient anxiety, you're going to have flashbacks, you're going to have really intense emotions. So being able to accept that it will go away and that that emotion, that experience does not, does not define you, even if it's unpleasant, is very important. So a training in ACT before the psychedelic experience and also a training after for integration in, the act, in, in ACT is very positive. It also helps develop psychological flexibility, as we said before, and personal commitment with the objective of self-regulating emotionally and reinterpreting context, emotion, sensation, and thoughts in favor of one's well-being. So it's, as we, uh, psych psychedelic psychotherapists 
adapt towards the client, the patient. It's important that the person, the patient, the client adapts towards the situation. So because we do, they do. So this is like such a huge system where every little part connects with each other. Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Act, which is one of the most used, is known to be effective outside of psychedelics against four anxiety disorders, depression, PTSD, OCD, and addiction. Because you basically learn to hold, as we said before, a negative emotion or a negative unpleasant experience. But there's a lot of growth in that. This is very like a Buddhist kind of approach. Like just don't hold to pleasure and don't hold to unpleasure. Just be, you know? So it's the acceptance of experience, emotion, unpleasant situation, and navigating the discomfort and pain, right? Navigating the thoughts that depression brings, chronic pain, for example, you develop with this a uh, psychological flexibility and also the personal personal commitment with one values, right? Like you're not driven through pleasure, with uh, you are not driven towards pleasure, you're driven towards well-being. And that well-being is not determined by the amount of pleasure. For example, with addiction, maybe the drug gives you pleasure, but what actually, if you take away the pleasure, what actually gives you well-being is not taking the drug right just being free from that it's the sign act is the sign for emotional self-regulation reinterpretation of the context emotion sensations and thoughts in favors of one well-being this um therapy is this psychotherapy is based on six, six psychotherapeutic processes with of course scientific evidence acceptance cognitive diffusion so it's basically separating what we think it is with what could be the observing self so it's just basically as in mindfulness being an observer and not a participant of one's pain and pleasure so basically observing yourself not from the wheel of reward but from this like distance prudential distance you also have mindfulness that is known to is known to have scientific evidence that will be focused on the present moment through clarity of values and commitment committed action. Mindfulness, as we said before, that is full attention. Uh, these are meditation practices that come from Buddhism and are translated into a Western understanding and with a clinical perspective. There are meditation practices and relaxation exercise. It's basically paying conscious attention to the present moment without judgment. <laughs> Cultivating passion, acceptance, and not making value judgments. It's based on, as we said before, in Buddhist meditation techniques, and it's adapted to treatment. Normally, it's uh, eight-week week protocols. We know that it's effective in case of depression, anxiety, addiction, eating disorders, HTHD, and PTSD. We also have open focus meditation that it will be like sort of a variation of mindfulness. But this is a Buddhist meditation technique as we see Buddhism really, not as a religious perspective, but as you know, from our occidental way of understanding and specifically from a clinical view, we know these tools help you. It's a meditation, uh, open meditation, effortless and without a focus to concentrate. Whereas maybe mindfulness, you might at some point focus on sounds, on sensations, so you try to be present in the sensation, in the sound. So you learn how to train, you train your attention to conduct it towards wherever you want to go, like a light. Imagine like everything is dark and your attention is a, a, a lantern, a light, and it, you just focus on whatever you want to focus. Like I want to focus on, instead of in pain, I want to focus on compassion. By the way, 
kindness, compassion, and gratitude are anti-inflammatory feelings. So when you have and cultivate these feelings, it's more, more likely that you're gonna have a more modulated uh, nervous system, less inflammated nervous system, right? This is very important. And this is something mix that most religions, but specifically Buddhism, instead of religions, I'm just gonna say spiritual practices, right? Because they all have this like notion of being compassionate, um, forgiving, right? Helping the other, helping yourself. It's important. So the differ differentiation between open focus meditation and mindfulness will be that mindfulness with the lantern that we said before, you focus onto a point, sound, feeling, uh, body scan, you focus your attention through your body so you train your mind. With open focus meditation, you just open your attention. You are not focusing attention on anything, which is a rest for the attention system, right? And from there, you can obtain like and allow the system to like auto regulate itself uh, and put attention more unconsciously on whatever it has to be put in. Put. So it's basically observing oneself without judgment and without the need to understand. This is very important, and we'll get into this later. Or concentrate into anything specific. Just feel. This is also very important for the psychedelic experience. Once you are in the psychedelic realm or the psychedelic world or, yeah, whatever you want to name it, the, in the psychedelic itself, you just go through it, right? And sometimes you try to, like, control, understand, give a meaning. And really it's not about that. It's just feeling and, and digesting. Sometimes you don't, not sometimes, you don't digest consciously. You just digest. So this will be kind of the same focus, open focus meditation, just digesting. This technique is known to reduce the default mode network. As we said, the ego, the self. You are not focusing the attention in trying to understand if the lady on the street was looking at you and that's why she was looking bad at you because you're a bad person because when you were like a teenager, you did something wrong and this is why the lady in the street is looking bad at you. You know, this like, Default mode, uh, default mode network functioning of trying to understand and give meaning and take that into our own memory, you know, right, and into our own identity. It's not about that. It's disactivating the self-reference. It's not about us. It's just we are here and that's it, basically, which is not small. There's also changes in emotional self-regulation. And it can diminish the functional connectivity between areas of the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior uh, default network. So basically, diminishing, less control, uh, less need of control, and less metacognition. These, as I said before, things in the brain are so complex. I'm just really trying to like bring some sentence to understand the psych, to translate into the psycho, into to translate into the psychological realm, some things that neuroscience know, right? There's some neuropsychology here. So basically, there is less uh, need of controlness and less mech, metacognition about how I'm thinking about how I'm thinking because I am this and because of that I think like this. There's more flow. And because of that, you are able to just be present in the moment without like uh, too much energy going towards the default mode network, trying to understand who you are in in this moment. No, you're just in the moment, and that's pretty much it. So this is a really interesting study. All of them are really interesting, I gotta say. But this one talks about how there's an increase in the trait mindfulness because mindfulness can be a technique, a tool, a therapy, but it's also a trait. Like how present are you? How mindful are you? And this correlates mindfulness with mystical type experience after psilocybin. So basically this was with 39 healthy patients 
we will see patients, but it will be healthy participants, where psychedelic assisted therapy using psilocybin is conducted, medium to high doses. We, what we, where are we going to evaluate here? The 5-HT2A receptor binding levels. If there's another lecture about um, neuroscience and receptors, you'll dig into this because it's super, super interesting. And there's some new research going on with this one and the TRKB, but that's another topic. So basically these receptors binding levels in the neocortex frontal limbic regions, so regarding emotions, are being evaluated. There's also being evaluated the MEC, that is the Mystical Experience Questionnaire, and the MAAAs, that is the Attention and Consciousness uh, Questionnaire. Basically, in the results, maybe you don't see it here because it's quite small, but let me translate that to you. So there's a correlation between the mystical experience and an increase in long-term consciousness and attention. If you see God, you are most likely to be present in your day-to-day -day life. You're most likely to give attention to life because you saw life there. So now you know life and you're able to communicate better with life. Just like a translation, no? And on a neurocortex uh, perspective, there's a reduction of the union of 5-HT2A receptor correlating with a greater mystical experience uh, and consciousness attention in, in participants. So there's a psychological correlation and there's a neuroscientific correlation between having seen God and having a more present life. So here we, we talk about the mystical experience. It's basically oneness with the universe, right? Most people say in the qualitative uh, research that is being made in psychedelics that it could be one of the most significant experiences of their life between, between like uh, top five normally, top 10 or top five, uh, between like having the birth of my daughter and the day uh, my father died and the psychedelic experience is in that level, okay? It's a moment of insight, transcendence, belonging, connection, right? There's a greater spiritual effect. And a, I mean, the greater the spiritual effect is, the greater the improvement in the symptoms. So the more... A God taste you have in the psychedelic, the more likely you're going to improve your symptoms. And this correlates of something we said before in ketamine, for example. There's a correlation between uh, the kind of participant and the outcome. No, So participants that are pretty bad are more likely to have a bigger outcome. And it, there, there could be some correlation, correlation between this, no? because they're so bad that Suddenly they see something so unique and so heart melting, if you want to use that term, that they just abandon the, the last model they used to have about life and about themselves. Also the mystical experience from a psychotherapeutical view, it can be used as psychological material. Like you can work with this. Um, and even if I go for, for example, uh, patients that do have spiritual beliefs, uh, this mystical experience can be used with their uh, religious beliefs as tools. Like you can use the religious beliefs as tools, like a therapeutic opportunity to heal. Obviously, adapting to the person, you know? And as I said before, uh, it will be interesting to start speaking about metaphysics instead of mysticism. Because for scientists, uh, doctors, you talk about your mystical experience and they're gonna go straight towards, oh, they're having a psychotic outbreak. And, but if you talk about metaphysics, like how I understand, I understand life and myself in it, it's easier to like more from a 
a philosophical perspective rather than a spiritual perspective, it's easier to digest for scientists. So this is an invitation. And we also have, uh, there's this new research, brand new, that just uh, came out last week. Uh, basically, I mean, this is something that people were saying, the researchers were talking about and were fantasizing about, but due to this research, uh, now we know that it's possible. So I don't have it in the slides because it's last week, fresh new. Uh, how we know that the, 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 the receptor 5 ta 2 a is the one that gives the positive uh, psychedelic experience. This means by positive, I don't mean like good or bad. I mean like hallucinations, uh, visuals, right? Uh, hearing, all these like um, things that you can measure through phenomenology, the phenomenological experience. This goes through the 5-TH2A. Uh, but they just found out that there is another receptor that works with the negative aspects of the psychedelic uh, experience. And by negative, it's not bad. It's just like they're not phenomenologically present. So I'm talking about the antidepressant um, factor, the antidepressant factor, and I'm talking about the neuroplasticity. So we know that we have a psychological perspective and we know that we have a pharmacological perspective. And this pharmacological perspective, it's what brings the question, can psychedelics work without the psychedelic effects, right? So regarding this uh, research, they could, because the receptor TRQB, uh, for example, when it binds with psychedelics, is a thousand times more effective than an SSRI. A thousand times. That's a lot. So that's a lot of uh, improvement. So imagine you just take a psychedelic without the psychedelic effect. And also for migraine, there is this Romo LSD that works without the psychedelic effect to treat migraine. So this is something that has been explored. This is something that has been like researched. And we will see if some of the improvement comes from the psychological or the pharmacological, or it's probably a mix. Because if there's a link between mystic experience and improvement in symptoms, what is going on there? More research needs to be made. So another, um, let's say non-based therapy, as it's not being that explored, but in the practice is very used because this is what brings the juice it's logotherapy. It's uh, created by Victor Frank. It's basically the therapy of the purpose of life. This is when you ask yourself, what for? No, not why am I doing this, but what for? Okay, I'm, I'm consuming alcohol. Why? Because it's very accessible, because my father used to do it, because I'm addicted. But what for? And that's the question. Okay, I'm using it because I don't want to feel myself. Okay, there you have your answer. So there's a sense of purpose in life, and you can use that as a therapeutic tool. There's scientific evidence that uh, is very effective for chronic illnesses and increases the quality of life. So, for example, in autoimmune disease, fibromyalgia, and so on, arthritis, arthritis uh, just going towards the therapy, the meaning of life, improves your quality of life as you have to cohabitate with that illness forever. Uh, it's very linked with the mystical experience, and uh, it allows you to give meaning, right? To give meaning to the uncertainty, be able to accept, have compassion, because you understand. But it also brings something very important that, and we talked about this in open meditation, you don't need to give meaning to everything. We are not men to know if black holes have intentionality. We can't digest that. So it's also very healthy to not give meaning to everything, right? Because sometimes if you think psychosis is giving extra meaning, like that person is looking at me because they know something about me. Maybe the woman was just looking in your direction, you happen to be there. You don't have to put too much meaning. That's too much the full network.
as we said before, too much interpretation. It's also good to cultivate, not giving meaning, but giving meaning to the important things in life. Other therapies and psychotherapies that are used in uh, a psychedelic assisted therapy are transpersonal psychology, psychoanalysis, uh, Jung especially, he's very, he's very used, um, his therapy is very used in, especially in integration because he has a lot of symbolic and unconscious and archetypical knowledge that when you enter in the psychedelic realm, you kind of uh, see portrayed in various forms. Just style psychology, somatic therapy, breathwork, art therapy, and even hypnosis, EMDR, uh, it's also been used. Art therapy is super used. For integration, uh, purely integration. So the post-psychedelic session, the, the just registering, you have the, all the expressive therapies, for example, psycho writing, right? Poetry or, or just writing, uh, art therapy, music therapy. You also have movement therapy. For example, maybe you cannot like express with a word, but you just make a move and this is what you felt. You felt this in your, in your trip, right? Um, also like you can do it in group therapy. This is also very useful in circles. For example, Rogerian group therapy, where the, the, the experience of the other helps you integrate your own. Obviously, mindfulness is observing the feeling, act, acceptance and commitment therapy, and somatic therapy. Because sometimes it's very difficult to explain what you saw and translate into words what you saw. So maybe like, just with a movement, you are able to, as I said before, to, to integrate how it feels, right? For integration in consolidation and digestion, so after like one day, two weeks, you know, after the experience, the psychedelic experience, you have um, cognitive behavioral therapy for like just, for example, addictions and try to implement new behaviors with this new light that you have, a group therapy, mindfulness act, logotherapy, music therapy too. By the way, music, as I said before, here you have examples of how important. And you can see music uh, through different lens. For example, you can see music as a psychedelic, music that boosts psych uh, therapeutical effects, and you can see music as a great ally in the psychedelic session, right? We know that if you have music, a toleration of the ketamine for bipolar is better. A, it even can modulate the hippocampal connectivity. Um, it can support peak mystical experience that we know are, decrease the symptoms, right? And now talk about the psychotherapeutic material. So we have memories. Sometimes you you even have like a, you you react a memory right. Uh, we have the adjustment of self uh, referential encoding, distortion of perception, reformulation of signifiers. So you have new reality models, increase me increasement, increase of cognitive flexibility, increase of full presence of mindfulness, mystical experience, and symbolic and archetypical context. This is the cycle. Uh, this is the psychotherapeutic material that we will be working in, uh, in these kind of sessions. The, to sum up, we know that the limbic system, that it will be the emotional centers, insula, cingulate cortex, uh, and so on, have uh, increased the connectivity between amygdala, hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex areas, which means a better digestion of memories and a decrease of fear in doing so. We have uh, alpha waves. Uh, its decrease makes it so that there is no control over the hippocampus, right? So if the alpha waves, waves go down, there is more flow of memories and emotions. Therefore, because Memories are uh, coded as uh, emotions. You 
most of the times you don't like there's a lot of data in memory so the way to encode it is through emotions so when you let go emotions you are letting go a content like memory content so in psychedelics there's a disinhibition of the hippocampus so a lot of emotions and flow of memories arrives so there could be probably an autobiographical or traumatic content that connected with the connectivity of amygdala hippocampus and prefrontal areas is able to digest also just be careful with false memories that can appear and need to be reevaluated if in integration this is what i say don't take uh, as a total reality what ayahuasca told you it's an interpretation you know try to put that into your own life translate that you also have semantic effects as a for example you know that semantic affects the emotional because it's part of all these interconnected areas and psychedelic states uh, facilitate the detection and reformulation of beliefs and transform them through creative solutions so there's a new narrative going on it also relaxes belief systems and make them more permeable so if you feel you are the worst person maybe psychedelics you don't feel that much so new information arrives and also this influence the self-narrative and the world perception as we said about the default mode network that we have been explaining through all the talk but it's an intimate narrative basically it's who you think you are uh, it manipulates information from memory and it interprets the meaning of external events so what happened is a dissolution because it lowers the activity of this uh, network <laughs> um it decreases the activity of this network so there's a dissolution of the ego the self or the identity in clinical disorders as we said this is hyperactive so the modulation of this is very good and it's something we look for and and decreases the connectivity between these areas right so there's a disconnection between memory from metacognition so you don't think too much about your memories you just leave them and the, so what happens with psychedelic is the self-referential participation it's as an observer observer self so cognitive flexibility is the adaptive capacity to work towards your limits it's increased by act mindfulness and psychedelics it increases the cognitive flexibility after psychedelic states uh, uh, and this cognitive flexibility is related to higher quality of life in some cases remissions of symptoms cognitive flexibility in neuropsychology is the core of well-being doesn't matter how well your attention your memory your cognitive uh execution works if you are not flexible and adapt doesn't matter if you have the best memory you're not going to be able to adapt well and now let's engage in some small somatic exercise but that's for another chapter thank you so much hope you enjoy I hope you learn a lot. So you can connect me. Uh, that's my phone. That's my Instagram. And that's my um, email if you have any question. And also, um, you can visit in awe, in awe.life. Uh, it will be in the description uh, to know more about how psychedelic works in your brain and the latest psychedelic news. Thank you so much.